Good afternoon and welcome back. Um, it's good afternoon for this session. Uh, so I'm really delighted that uh, Mark has agreed uh, to talk here. It's going to give us um, a bit of an overview in a sort of integration and synthesis about um, the applications of uh, microbial uh, genomics. So thank you very much. Mark. Great, thank you. Well, thanks to Naz for inviting me. It is a bit odd that I'm the sole microbiologist in this session and there's a whole other microbiology session over there. Um, but I'll try and represent our discipline as best I can. Um, I'm recording this, so I'll put this up on YouTube, which is what I try to do with all my research talks. Um, and so you'll find it on my YouTube channel in the next few days. Now, before I start, I have to put in an apology. Because when I wrote the few lines for the abstract uh, some time ago, I thought, oh, I could talk about everything uh, to do with medical microbiology and genomes. And then I thought, I can't. I mean, there's just not time. And so I'm actually not going to talk about microbiomes, because that man up there, George spoke about them uh, the other day uh, and did great justice to the subject. And he also mentioned that there is this rather sceptical piece in Nature the other day, which you know, was a little bit sceptical about microbiomes. I'm not going to express an opinion on microbiomes one way or the other, but I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to stick to talking about um, genomics and metagenomics of pathogens uh, rather than microbiomes. Now, the, this kind of first ingress of genomics into medical microbiology came in what we might call the golden era back in uh, 1995 and on for a decade or more after then. Um, and it was really exciting as a microbiologist to be alive in that era because that was the time when we got the first glimpse in silico of some of humankind's most fearful adversaries like tuberculosis and Yersinia pestis and uh, George's case Treponema pallidum he looked at uh, and that was very exciting and we got those genome sequences during that era of all the significant bacterial pathogens of humans, animals, plants and this delivered not just key insights into the biology of the pathogen but also gave us um, lots of uh, payback in terms of drug targets vaccine targets, diagnostic targets, and even things that we didn't expect to get. Um, so a friend of mine, Brendan Wren, was involved in sequencing Campylobacter jejuni genome, um, and he came out with new glycosylation systems that he could use in a biotechnological way from sequencing a pathogen genome, something he didn't expect. Second phase of that era, we started then getting multiple genomes from the same species, all using Sanger sequencing, shotgunning, and so forth. And this gave us key insights into genomic diversity and really made it clear that bacteria play by different rules. Uh, large amounts of horizontal gene transfer, lots of diversity within species. So two E. coli strains may differ by 25 or 30 percent of their genome um, and still be within the same species. The uh, American Society for Microbiology asked me to edit a book on this subject, Bacterial Pathogenomics, in 2006 or 7, I think it was. And uh, at the time, I didn't realize that actually it was the kind of the end of an era. It was almost like the closing chapter of that era because obviously the next thing came along, which was high throughput sequencing. So instead of sequencing being the prerogative only of large sequencing centers, we've seen this democratization of sequencing. Uh, and thousands of times faster, cheaper, a really a disruptive technology which basically changed the way we thought about things, changed the landscape of opportunities. Um, and there are lots of technologies, I don't need to take this to this audience, and in the marketplace, lively competition. Maybe we've got a bit of a monopoly at the moment, but that won't last forever. Um, and also, a few years into this revolution, we then saw uh, it becoming even easier and more accessible with the advent of benchtop sequencing, where you could have these benchtop sequences like the MySeq or the Iron Tron 454 Junior that would basically fit on a bench size of a laser printer. And then this meant that medium sized and even small uh, research groups could actually get in and start doing sequencing and have an impact um, and bring it into uh, real world clinical problems and, and, and dealing with them. So what is the clinical need in diagnostic microbiology? Um, uh, here I've taken a, a screen dump of a figure from a paper published a couple of years ago uh, by uh, Derek Crook and, and people in his group, where they 
basically tried to remove the anaesthetic of familiarity. We kind of got used to the idea that when you go into the, particularly the bacteriology laboratory, you have to do all these different things and these very complex workflows. So we have lots of different samples and each different sample has to have a different set of media that it goes on to. Uh, and then you, know, you have all these different kinds of culture media, different kinds of atmospheric conditions you grow them in, and then you gram stain. Nowadays we do Molditoff to identify. Uh, TB are different because we have to do acid fast testing and so forth. Uh, and then you've got to grow them in single colony uh, subculture uh, to identify them as, at species level. And then you want to do susceptibility testing. And you want then if you're interested in epidemiology, you want to do typing. And this is it's all very complex. It's all very labour intensive. And the dream is that you could remove most of this diagram and replace it with just genome sequencing or high throughput sequencing. Uh, so the point they made in their uh, paper about transforming clinical microbiology is that you could go from the stage where you've got the media for culture and you've got organisms growing, you can just sequence their genomes and you don't have to worry about phenotypic uh, species identification, and susceptibility testing and typing and so forth. As I say at the end, we, we've, we're thinking of even going one step further than that. Now, the UK leads the field here, I think we could say. Um, so I always say that we invented all the best forms of sequencing as well. Uh, you know, Oxford Nanopore invented here, um, Selexa sequencing invented here, and all the uh, and Sanger sequencing invented in the UK. All the dull and boring forms of sequencing some invented over the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and also, we can be very proud that we have here uh, at least three centres of excellence. So we have got the, what we might call the Oxford Posse, and they are um, sequencing genomes, uh, C. difficile genomes, Staph aureus genomes, um, some viral genomes. This is just a few of their papers. Uh, and they are doing their, their bit to transform the field and transform our understanding of the epidemiology and uh, the uh, clinical applicability of these methods. Of course, you know, like in the boat race, there's another team as well. There's the Cambridge Posse, Sharon Peacock, the Sanger Centre, and those people doing lots of similar kinds of things. Now, if I had an hour or two hours, I could take you through many of their studies as well as our own, but we don't have time. But just making you aware that we really do have tremendous capacity in this country uh, in this area. I, of course, have belonged to the Midlands Posse, and we've been doing our bit as well. Uh, Nick Lohman, who's in the other session, uh, has worked with me uh, in Birmingham for several years, and now I've just moved to Warwick, and now I've recruited another guy called Mark Achman into our posse. And, and, and in the Midlands, we're doing all sorts of great stuff as well. Now, what I'm going to do now is just take you through some uh, vignettes and case studies from our work as how we're actually using genome sequencing uh, in a clinical setting to inform practice and, and, and clinical decision making. So one organism that we settled on, um, partly by accident because it was causing a problem locally and also partly because the Sanger weren't interested in it, and they, were, they have a big footprint and we didn't want to you know, step into their footprint, is an organism called Acinetobacter baumannii. It's a gram-negative bacillus uh, and it's particularly problematic because it's multi-drug resistant, um, at least nowadays it is, there were past sensitive strains, but now we see multi-drug resistance, and in fact it's, it's moving towards pan-resistance. Uh, there are a couple of agents, colistin and tigercycline, that are kind of used as reserve agents uh, for difficult cases, but even then you can get resistance to them as well now. It's associated with wound infections, ventilator-associated pneumonia, gets into the blood, and an interesting uh, feature of this organism is it's actually been a very dominant, predominant organism in military personnel returning from the conflicts, in, first of all in Iraq and also uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and in the UK, we now have the military uh, patients being nursed, uh, cared for in the same environment as um, uh, civilian patients. And in fact, they come to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital um, in, in Birmingham as the major place where they actually come and have their. Uh, trauma dealt with and, and so forth. And, and in the UK, in that setting, and in, in the US, I think in Canada as well, and in, I think in France maybe, uh, they've, they've actually seen transmission from military people to civilian casualties in the same hospital, and, and, and you get transmission uh, 
um, within the hospital. In Birmingham, they've seen uh, what we might call serial clonal outbreaks of uh, Acinetobacter baumannii. So an organ, a strain will come into the hospital, it will often sputter on for a while, infect a few people, and then it will die out, and there will be no Acinetobacter around for a while, and then there will be a reintroduction. In, in other parts of the country, in London, I hear that it's more or less endemic. They never actually get rid of it. It's always in the hospital. One of the problems in the lab is it's hard to identify Acinetobacter baumannii, and particularly to uh, distinguish it from some very closely related, what they call genomo species, which have now been called Pitii and Nosocomialis. Um, and you can identify outbreaks by conventional typing methods, but you can't really look in within the outbreak to get a high resolution view of what's going on, work out exactly how it's spreading within the hospital, what are the, the routes of transmission, what are the transmission chains within the hospital. So in Birmingham at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital there was an outbreak of a particular strain. Um, it was given a, a, a PFGE type, a pulse field gel electrophoresis type, pulsar type designation of 27 uh, by the reference laboratory in London. Um, and we saw the first reported case in a military patient in July of 2011. <laughs> And then this turned out to be a kind of record-breaking outbreak in that it went on for 80 weeks and involved over 60 patients, including military and civilian patients. And as I was we were working in Birmingham at the time, and we, we knew the clinical microbiologists who were looking after this, particularly infection control officer Beryl Oppenheim, we actually genome sequenced uh, isolates from the outbreak. And we ended up genome sequencing over 90 isolates from from patients, but we also uh, genome sequenced some environmental isolates as well uh, on, on our MySeq that we had. We created a, a reference um, strain uh, genome um, with 454 sequencing mixed with Illumina at, at the outset, and then we used Illumina after that to cause SNPs. Um, and we found that the outbreak strain was distinct from all other strains, uh, including the strains that had been previously implicated in the hospital outbreaks in Birmingham and in the local region. And this just uh, shows a kind of colour coding of the patients who had uh, been infected or colonised with Acinetobacter baumannii during this outbreak, um, and shows the length of stay and the wards they were on uh, by colours, and the vertical lines are the dates of isolation of the organism. And one of the things that was quite apparent um, early on was that you could account for most of the transmission in the early phase of the outbreak by saying, well, they're on the same ward, and it's cross-infection between patients, maybe in adjacent beds or nearby beds on the same ward. But that didn't explain what was going on later on in the second phase of the outbreak, uh, where it, was, it started to become predominantly burns patients in the burns unit, where they're actually isolated in individual rooms, um, and it, it became harder to explain what was, how was transmission occurring. And there we implicated a burns theatre. It turned out that many of those patients were actually going to the same burns theatre, and the theatre environment was actually getting colonised with the organism. So when we did the, 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 the SNP genotyping, we, we managed to sort the uh, genotypes into these seven major uh, SNP uh, genotypes, and we saw some things that made sense. We saw a kind of uh, steady acquisition of SNPs during the outbreak, during the, the, the isolates coming out of the outbreak, relative to the, uh, the first isolates we saw. Um, so we, we had these four isolates at the beginning we called genotype one, and then uh, ev almost everything else, apart from two other isolates, had one SNP, which we called SNP2. Um, and then we have this lineage that goes, if you can see, that, that, that goes through the, um, the, the main part of the figure here, um, where you're steadily acquiring SNPs, and everything afterwards has that same SNP. So that kind of made, you know, it was nice to see that we were getting a, a kind of comprehensible, uh, coherent kind of result. One of the other things, though, that we did see that was interesting is that we, we didn't just uh, see this movement forward. It, it, for, for many of the genotypes, you saw a kind of cloud of SNPs, SNP genotypes that are closely related to the main genotype, but are just one or, or two SNPs different uh, as time went on. So what we did was we used the genomic data and we used information uh, collected, uh, conventional kind of infection control epidemiology information 
shoe leather epidemiology, if you like, to reconstruct transmission events and transmission routes. Um, when you went with just the shoe leather epidemiology, it was you know, we, we came up with like over 200 uh, different potential transmission events, but we managed to wrestle this down when we added the genomics to a much smaller, more, more parsimonious set of just over 60 uh, events. And this linked all but seven of the patients in a very straightforward, single most parsimonious transmission event. As I said earlier, we, initially we got this cross-infection between patients in the same ward at the same time, and we were able to confirm that the ward environment was getting uh, colonized uh, by the organism by environmental swabbing. And, that, and, and we genome sequenced those, and we actually could confirm they were coming from those patients, and they were part of the outbreak. And that led to a tightening of the ward decontamination procedures, and that did ha actually help to control the outbreak. We did, in some cases, though, where there wasn't a direct link, we, we said, well, what's going on here? And we, we looked at what had been going on, and we found, oh, these two patients had been using the, the same equipment. They had been on a bronchoscopy list, and that maybe the bronchoscope was, was at fault there. Late in the outbreak, we homed in on the Burns Theatre, which was closed and then underwent deep cleaning, and the outbreak appeared to be under control for a while, but then we got these, um, it, it flared up again, and... Again, we got this linkage here but through the environment, but it was through a particular, very specialised Burns care bed, a particular mattress that prevented bed sores and so forth, that hadn't been decontaminated properly um, and been shared by these two patients. And the outbreak flared up again, and we had to improve the decontamination protocol for that bed, but also do more deep cleans of the, of the Burns theatre. And then the outbreak finished. Now, you may argue, well, what's the point of all that genome sequencing? People are doing infection control like this anyway. Does it add any value? Um, and is it worth the money and all the effort? Well, there are a number of things that we did with the genome sequencing. We managed to exclude isolates from the outbreak quite effectively. So we could say that's not part of the outbreak. It's not part of the outbreak strain. You don't have to worry about how that patient got it in the outbreak because it's not part of the outbreak. Uh, in some cases, we actually identified this related species, Acinetobacter pitii, and we, and we actually identified a second outbreak of Acinetobacter pitii, a very small outbreak, just you know, one or two cross-infection events caused by that organism. Um, so that was something we wouldn't have seen uh, very easily otherwise. We linked the patients via their SNP genotypes, and as I say, it made a kind of coherent story as we went through the outbreak. We were able to link the patients to the environmental isolates, and this gives you much more strength when you're going to say, right, we need to do a proper deep clean of this environment, of this ward, of this theatre, because we know these are the very same genotypes in the environment that are coming from the patients. It gives you a lot, lot more strength to your argument um, as you're doing that. We showed these with inpatient clouds of diversity, which was interesting. And in some cases, we actually got mixed infections of two different genotypes. And in, in some cases, we actually had Acinetobacter pitii mixed in with Baumannii. Um, and that uh, actually challenges the, the, like, the long-held practice of microbiology where you just pick a single colony and work on that. Uh, it's clear that there's actually a lot of diversity in these, in these wounds and other in, uh, environments than we would have expected. We, when we started this project, it was mainly retrospective. We started like a third of the way into the outbreak. But as we got towards the end of the outbreak, we were actually turning the stuff around very quickly, and we were going from a colony to a SNP genotype in, in less than, than one week. So we were, you know, we're giving a service comparable to what you would get if you sent the stuff off to a reference laboratory to get typed. Uh, and so that was also very valuable in, in giving advice to the clinicians and to the infection control team in real time. So that was one outbreak that we've been involved in, and, and uh, that is in its final revision in genome medicine and should be coming out in November in the special edition of genome medicine. So you'll be able to pick that up there, the paper on that. Another outbreak that we uh, got involved in in terms of the genome sequencing was this e outbreak of E. coli 0104H4, uh, which some wag has called the sprout break because it was associated uh, with the consumption of bean sprouts. Uh, and this was a very large outbreak that uh, hit Germany uh, in, in May and June of 2011. I think it's over 5,000 cases in the end and over 50 deaths. So the slide's a little out of date. Linked to these sprouting seeds, a lot of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is the kind of worst case, the worst uh, 
uh, think the scenario you get with this, uh, this, this e type of E. coli, this sugar toxic producing E. coli infection, um, and females for some reason particularly at risk in that outbreak. And you can see the outbreak was centered uh, on northern Germany, although there were cases throughout Germany, and there were cases in other European countries, including the UK, uh, from people returning uh, from Germany. And what we did was we, we did something which we, we called open source genomics, uh, where basically the genome was sequenced. It turned out the genome se was sequenced on an iron torrent uh, in Shenzhen by BGI. So our German collaborators sent the DNA off there and got it sequenced. Um, and then BGI released the data uh, directly onto the internet without any uh, uh, cons constraints on usage whatsoever. And Nick Lohman, uh, who was working in my group at the time and had been working up the protocols to actually handle iron torrent data, then assembled that data and came up with a draft assembly of the genome and then posted that without any uh, constraints on the internet and called on the rest of the community, and he's very active on Twitter, uh, to actually have a look at the data themselves. And what actually happened there was we got these crowdsourced analyses um, with people around the world, in, in, in different continents and countries, in America, in South Africa, in China, in Hong Kong, in Australia, all chipping in and actually doing uh, bits of analyses and then posting their analyses up on this special wiki site, open source wiki. And so within a week, there were over 20 reports on this uh, genome. And much of the analysis was done by people, in fact, almost all of it was done by people who were not professional public health microbiologist, public health genomicist, um, and it was a very remarkable uh, uh, kind of find that we, we, we got to that stage. And the interesting thing was that this actually um, showed that social media, things like blogging and Twitter, which often people disregard as oh, this is stupid and a waste of time, actually powerfully augmented academic discourse and managed to rally all of this activity together. There's a key role also for benchtop sequencers. This is one of the first uses of a uh, benchtop sequencer uh, in, in this kind of work. And this is just a screen dump from that uh, from the website where people were posting all the time. And you can just see from the diversity of names um, that you know, you've got English names, Spanish names, Chinese names, Polish names, uh, people from all around the world tipping in and, and actually doing their analyses. And the takeaway messages from that particular outbreak and that analysis of the outbreak was that clearly infection is still a, a big problem. And so although everyone says, oh yeah, you've got to worry about cancer and you've got to worry about heart disease and diseases of old age and infection, that's, that's yesterday's problem. It's not, not true. Um, also, it's clear that pathogens don't bother with passports. They do move around the world pretty quickly. And it turned out that that strain, once the genome had been sequenced, it, it was clear that there had been something very similar seen in Germany 10 years before and the other side of the world in Korea. And the closest genome sequence strain actually had come from the Central African Republic um, and had come from patients with uh, HIV infection uh, who, who um, it wasn't clear whether it was actually causing disease in those patients. It became clear also that this was a very unusual lineage, it's what we call enteroagrative E. coli. Uh, which is unexpected. Uh, so although it's producing the sugar toxin, it didn't belong to the normal group that we see uh, associated with sugar toxin production. And this gave the conclusion that basically it probably was circulating from humans. It wasn't uh, with, if you look at, say, E. coli 0157, you'd, you'd go and look for some cows somewhere because it's usually come from cows or other animals that have got in the way, where their feces have got into the human food chain. Uh, whereas that didn't seem to be the case here. And there was basically all sorts of evolution going on within the strain. Um, and we also saw antibiotic resistance. Even though people weren't using antibiotics to treat the infection, uh, and certainly not the ones that you saw resistance to, they were there, which was kind of ominous as well. So we actually managed to write that up in the New England Journal as a brief report. Um, and we went over, myself and Nick, to go and meet our German collaborators. We'd only spoken to by email and, and so forth up to then. Uh, and we had some champagne. And then we said, all right, what are we going to do now then? Um, you know, we've, 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 are we just going to be like a one-hit wonder, or is there something more we can do? Uh, and we said, well, what, what are our unique selling points? And we, Nick and I said, well, we can sequence genomes and analyze them, sequences pretty well. Uh, and they said, 
Well, we've got this unique resource. We've got over 200 samples of, of feces from patients from the outbreak in our freezers. Okay, well, why don't we just sequence the ship, basically? Let's just go in there and sequence that, 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 those fecal samples directly and see if we can get any useful information out. So, we need to step back and say, what's the rationale for that? Well, the rationale is that basically the way we do certainly diagnostic bacteriology is that we're using 19th century techniques. We're using techniques invented by Christian Graham uh, and Robert Koch. Basically, we look down the microscope and stain things up and say, oh, that's a coccus or a rod or whatever, and then we grow them on solid media and we propagate them in single colony pure culture. And you kind of think, well, could we not be doing something better than that uh, in the 21st century? Um, and so what I was proposing was that we could actually use shotgun metagenomics in this capacity and use it in a diagnostic way. So instead of, as we had done in our analysis in the New England Journal paper of that outbreak, we'd gone from the stool sample to growing the organism and then extracting DNA and sequencing it, could we not get the same sequence information directly from the stool samples without bothering to culture? So that was the, the, the task we set ourselves. And so we asked our German collaborators to send us DNA extracted from the stools, which they did. And the very first sample, Nick uh, Lohmann actually an, uh, aligned the reads from the metagenome against the, the, the outbreak strain genome. And so you've got the coverage there. Uh, and, uh, and then the, that, well, the, it's the bit, this is the position in the genome there along the x-axis. Um, uh, and basically, you, you, we got good coverage of the genome, around 20-fold, more than 20-fold coverage of the genome on average. We got this kind of smiling effect because when you've got bacteria that are actively growing in log phase, the origin of replication is slightly overrepresented compared to other parts of the genome. We could actually work out what kind of strain it was uh, from um, pulling out the sequences. And there was this little upswing uh, partway along the genome that's in that little box there. And that was the part of the genome that actually encodes the, that contains the, the profiles, the bacterial virus that's integrated with the chromosome that encodes the toxin gene. Um, and that made, kind of made sense, but it gave us a glimpse into the direct, directly into the kind of biology of, of this infection in action. Because what we're seeing there is probably uh, free phage particles are actually present in the stool as well as the phage within the bacteria. And that's what we're, why we're seeing that overrepresentation. Anyway, we went on and did this on a, a, a larger set of samples, and we actually got quite good results. Variable, but that, nonetheless, it was quite convincing that it was working. And then we tried to submit it to JAMA, um, and the ed 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 editor sent it out to reviewers. And the reviewer who probably goes by the name of David Relman looked at it, and he made this point that it is cheating, because basically what we were doing was we were taking the metagenome and we were aligning it against the genome of the outbreak strain. And what they were saying, and I, I had already made this point to Nick, this is what we should be doing, and he said it was too difficult, it was too busy. But what we should have been doing was putting ourselves in the footsteps of the, uh, of the people trying to analyze the outbreak in real time, where you didn't have the outbreak strain genome, and reconstruct it completely a priori just from the metagenome. Um, so, you know, it's a bit like the difference between solving a jigsaw puzzle by looking at the lid or just doing it without any clue at all. And so we, we, well, the heat was on. There was a special issue of, of JAMA. We had to do this within a certain time. And so Nick got down to it and did what biometricians do and did his all-nighters working on the problem and showed very flexible and nimble thinking in, in how to address this. So what he said was, let's, let's just have a look at the complexity of the sequences within these stool samples in their metagenome. And, and he, he came up with this graphical display where we've got the, the, the coverage, the depth of coverage. Uh, we've got the GC content, which is a, a way of separating out bacteria taxonomically, if you like. And then he had also used homology-based methods to classify them and color-coded them. And this is the kind of complexity you get when you've got, um, when you're just looking at something that's present in, in more than one sample, anything that's present in more than one sample. Um, you can see that the enterobacteriales, which are, is, is the, uh, the, the taxon which in, in, in includes E. coli, is there in the middle, but there's so much else going on. So Nick said, well, let's make one simplifying assumption. The reads that belong to the pathogen genome are going to have to be present in at least half of the samples associated with this outbreak. 
you know, if it's an outbreak, that's, that's a reasonable assumption. So let's just subtract everything that's not present in at least half. So we took 40 samples. It's got to be, reads have to be present in at least 20 out of those 40 samples. And that led to a great simplification, as you can see there, of the kind of taxonomic mixture within, within the sample. But it still didn't give us the outbreak strain genome. Um, a long way from having a single organism genome there. So then he said, well, let's make one more assumption. Let's assume that the outbreak strain genome is not present in normal people. And as George has pointed out, that there have been these big metagenomic projects, the Human Microbiome Project, there's a MetaHIP project in, in, in Europe. Nick just went to the MetaHIP project and said, right, I'll just take 40 European stool samples from normal Europeans, and I'll subtract anything that's in them from this, these metagenomes, this meta-metagenome, if you like, of 40 samples. And when he did that, he actually got down to um, the outbreak strain genome. He got these uh, accessory genome from the E. coli strain. He actually, uh, because he, there was lots of E. coli present in all stool samples, he subtracted away the core genome of E. coli, so he had to go back in and get that, and he came up with a, yet another, working with a guy called Chris Quince, came up with another method, uh, which I won't go into, and in the end, he managed to pull out the outbreak strain, strain genome from, the, from the, those samples from the outbreak, completely a priori, and we wrote that up and got that published in JAMA. So that was a very nice test case of how we can actually go from genomics to metagenomics in a clinical setting and make use of it. Um, since then, there's been a couple other uh, examples of this kind of approach. Um, one uh, in, published in the New England Journal, uh, where they diagnosed neuroleptospirosis by just sequencing clinical sample directly. Uh, and our German collaborators actually used this approach to diagnose uh, chlamydia pneumonia infection uh, in a patient in Germany as well. Since we did that study in JAMA, we've also got involved in my group in looking at historical material. And we've looked at uh, some 200-year-old uh, mummified lung tissues. And we looked at a calcified nodule that was 700 years old. Um, and from the lung tissue, we managed to get TB genomes. We got uh, over 30-fold coverage of a TB genome from that. And from the brucella, uh, from the... Um, 700-year-old nodule, we got a Brucella melatensis genome from the metagenome. Uh, no culture because the organism was presumably dead. We didn't even try to culture it. Um, but it was, it was there as ancient DNA. Now, you might say, well, hang on, that's a step away from the clinical stuff, isn't it? You've got, suddenly gone into archaeology or whatever. But actually, it all connects because as we were analysing these samples, we started using an approach that Nick Lohman mentioned uh, in his talk just uh, before the break, uh, of phylogenetic placement, where you can actually call out the SNPs that you've got, even though that you haven't got great depth of coverage, enough to call every SNP robustly, you can use the data you've got to actually place that genome on a pre-computed phylogenetic uh, tree of, of all the diversity within that particular species or taxon. And so that's what we were able to do with this medieval Brucella genome. We were able to say, ah, it belongs, this one here, Gerudu 1, actually belongs here next to this um, more recent strain, the Melatensis, uh, Brucella melatensis ether. Um, and uh, you know, so we were not only able to identify as a Brucella, not only able to identify to a species name, but we were also able to put it into a particular clade. More recently, uh, just in the, last, uh, in the last year or so, we've been doing this kind of thing on sputum, uh, working with uh, Martin Antonio in the Gambia, um, and Emma Doughty, who's in the audience somewhere, PhD student, been out to the Gambia and extracting DNA from sputum samples from patients who have been diagnosed as smear positive tuberculosis patients. Um, and in, in doing so, then aligning those reads against uh, TB genomes, we've been able to detect in, in eight out of eight samples uh, the presence of M tuberculosis in the sample without culture. Uh, and culture, obviously, for TB is actually a particular problem because it's a very slow-growing organism. And so it takes weeks before you actually get a diagnosis, typically. Um, whereas here, you can go directly from the sputum sample to getting that information. But we also use the methods that we've been uh, pioneering on the, on the brucella to actually place the TB strains that are actually in the sputum sample on a phylogeny of TB and actually assign them to a particular 
particular lineages within the, the TB. Um, and in this case, most of them were belong to this Euro-American lineage, but there were two samples that we found where we had an organism called Mycobacterium africanum, which is a relative of the, the human tubercle bacillus, but is only found in West Africa, and is particularly associated with disease only in West Africa. Um, and so that was quite uh, an interesting finding that we felt very pleased that we could actually not just detect, but characterize uh, these. I'm just about finishing now, just about to finish up. Um, future prospects, well, you've heard about nanopore sequencing next door, uh, and that really does seem to be very exciting, that we'll have a little USB stick, and we can do all this stuff close to the patient. We can do it quickly and easily. Um, Whole genome sequencing has actually now become routine for TB, just in the, in the last year or so, a number of labs, Heartland in Birmingham are doing it. Probably it's going to become routine for other pathogens soon, I know that Public Health England are doing it for Salmonella E. coli. Uh, metagenomics can work on diagnostic emergencies now, it is an appropriate thing. Whether it will become routine for things like TB in the future, I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, there's a lot of method development needed before we can get it working really well, particularly if we want to detect resistance, but um, you know, there's a good chance it will work. And we, and we just need to keep practicing and, and moving forward with these things. Um, and um, I've just, at the last minute, I'm just going to say we've also got this, just recently got MRC funding to set up a cloud infrastructure to, to support all this microbial genomics, medical microbial genomics, so that people doing the bioinformatics can actually use a, this cloud facility, which will be free, a bit like Amazon Cloud, but you don't have to pay for it. Um, and, and we just got this money. This is uh, actually from a, um, a, a humorous uh, website where they took, made, made fun of us for getting this money. Uh, it's not actually true that we're going to spend the money on Apple Macintosh computers. But I'm running out of time, so I'll just finish now with the acknowledgements. Thank you very much. Thanks.